the speaker uh, for today. Uh, my name is Ali Kujuri, and I'm an adjunct professor here at this uh, the part of uh, uh, engineering science, uh, School of Science and Technology. Uh, let me uh, welcome you all on the behalf of, of the department and the school. Uh, also, I would like to uh, to thank uh, Agile Technology, who has been really sponsoring this department uh, in forever, and that uh, has been really uh, such a uh, such a uh, good thing for us uh, for uh, sponsoring uh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, lecture series uh, for uh, for uh, two weeks from now. Uh, we have uh, a speaker by the name of uh, uh, Jim Sackman, who is a VP of Access Development Strategic Labs. And uh, his uh, talk is uh, Deep Packet Inspection, Net uh, Neutrality, and You. And uh, this, this is going to be an interesting talk. And uh, 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 I hope uh, uh, you all are coming to hear this presentation. And for today, uh, um, our guest speaker is uh, Mr. Mike Powers. Uh, he's uh, uh, the engineering, engineering scientist uh, uh, at Agile Technologies. And his talk uh, uh, is on uh, men's in the 21st uh, century. <coughs> Mr. Mike Powers. Uh, is currently a materials and engineering scientist in the High Frequency Technology Center of Agilent Technologies in Santa Rosa, California, where he has worked for the past 20 years. His, his technological expertise is, is in the field of uh, uh, joining process technology, including glass to metal sealing, active metal brazing, reactive joining and lead free solder. Mike learned his uh, BS and uh, Master of Science from UC Berkeley in 1989 and 92 respectively, both in materials, uh, science and engineering. He holds eight US patents with two pending in uh, areas of chemical engineering and high frequency connector design. He has published a number of technical papers on joining of advanced engineering materials and materials characterization, and has served as editor for various uh, conference proceedings. He is chapter author and co-editor of the CRC Materials Processing Handbook, which was published in 2007. In 1995, he developed a nan-ozone depleting solvent chemistry to replace uh, CFC-113 uh, for critical cleaning of components used in the electronics industry. He's an, uh, an adjunct instructor at UC Davis in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science. So here is Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I, I've been to a couple of these lectures, and it turns out that uh, I'm at least the third that I know of Agilent uh, employee, uh, possibly more, giving lectures for this series. So uh, thank you, Dr. Kajori, for the uh, opportunity. So uh, let me uh, punch this button here. Yes, I forgot to thank you for you. <laughs> Perfect. See, 21st century technology. So this is going to be an overview of uh, current status of MEMS. It's not intended to be comprehensive, nor is it intended to be very deep. Uh, to do that would require uh, an entire, um, probably at least a quarter, maybe two of classwork to really cover uh, in depth all the uh, aspects and issues concerning MEMS in the 21st century. My objective here is to give an overview and hopefully uh, peak interest in this particular technology for those of you uh, that uh, might only have an ancillary um, uh, knowledge or um, exposure 
and also it, it gives me the opportunity to show some really nice micrographs and I uh, have to say up front that um, uh, Dr. Howe, Professor Howe uh, at UC Berkeley who is affiliated with uh, the Berkeley um, Sensor and Actuator uh, uh, Group, uh, BSAC, uh, provided me with a number of these micrographs and there are actually some really stunning micrograph. So if you get anything out of this at all, I think you'll, you'll enjoy the, the microscopy. So um, briefly, I'm, uh, this is what my outline looks like. I'm going to talk about incubation. In other words, how did this all start and, where, and how did we get here? A little bit of background. Uh, what are MEMS? And of course, that's an acronym. We'll talk about that in a second. We'll talk about materials for MEMS, fabrication of MEMS, packaging of MEMS, integration of MEMS, applications, which are all the fun part, and then where are we going in the future? So that first micrograph there is a, um, that is the world's smallest guitar. Um, if you haven't seen this before, it is about 10 microns in length. Um, you can see each of the strings is actually uh, individual. This is um, uh, surface micromachining in silicon. Uh, I'm now told, and I haven't seen this yet, but there is a group, I think, out of MIT that has now developed one of these guitars that you can actually play. They, play, the, they pick it with a laser. Um, so evidently it resonates, and um, of course the sound is not something the human ear can pick up, but it does actually put, it does resonate and put out a sound. It's a tremendous world we live in now. So, as far as incubation goes, I want to take you back to December 9th, 1959. Uh, a gentleman that I'm sure you've all heard of, uh, Dr. Richard Feynman. And he gave a now legendary uh, lecture for the American Physical Society at Caltech. And his lecture was called, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. Now, if you've never reviewed uh, the text of this lecture, I would strongly encourage you to do that. And make sure every time you read a sentence to remind yourself, it was 1959. And the things that this man was saying, when you look back in retrospect, are astounding. Feynman prophesied the direct manipulation of atoms that actually didn't occur until after his death in 1988. He prophesied denser computer circuitry. He prophesied atomic level microscopy, which I would like to point out as a Cal grad that I read a paper when I was in school. And I, was, I was a materials science major, and in grad school, my area of expertise was materials characterization, specifically high resolution transmission electron microscopy. I read a paper by uh, um, uh, somebody at Stanford that said, theoretically, atomic level resolution in microscopy is not possible. <laughs> Wait till you see the next slide. Um, that's OK. He, he, uh, he didn't get his degree from uh, Cal. Uh, nothing against the Stanford guys. <laughs> and I better watch it because the big game's coming up this year and Stanford's looking awful tough. He also <laughs> prophesied the concept of a micro, and I put that in quotes because he actually coined this term, micro machines, the Japanese later uh, latched onto it, and he, and he came up with this concept of swallowing the doctor. That is, he said, why can't we have something that's small like a pill that a person swallows and it's a little machine like a robot to go around inside a person's body and, and repair things, right? Sort of like that concept in that old movie, um, Fantastic Voyage. Anyone ever see that movie where they shrink the ship down to it and they inject it in the bloodstream? I, I thought that was a great movie. I, I saw that probably three times in a row. Um, so he, he prophesied that. I don't have a picture of it, but there's now a camera pill that people swallow that so they can do in situ observation. Um, and this is a direct quote from Feynman. Um, in the lecture, he said, why can't we write the entire 24 volumes in the Encyclopedia Botanica on the head of a pin? Why can't we? Well, now, that's no problem at all. Head of a pin, nothing. Way smaller than that. So, that's why I bring this up. This guy was a visionary, but what he was saying 
prophesied all these things that came to pass. So I submit that Feynman and his vision incubated and could be considered actually as the uh, father of nanotechnology. So remember this about the atomic level microscopy. Excuse, excuse me, by the way. Why does it say at the bottom? Because small. Oh, I see. Yes. Small. Uh, everybody would think of uh, tops down. He said we need to start at the bottom and okay. think very small and work our way up. So this is a uh, this is silicon. This is nanocrystalline silicon, and those are in fact individual silicon atoms on the lattice. And why I find this a particularly interesting micrograph, and this is a high resolution, actually atomic resolution transmission electron microscopy uh, micrograph that was taken at the National Center for Electron Microscopy at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory by C. Song. And this shows uh, multiple twinning in silicon. So this is what happens when you subject a single crystal silicon to um, severe in-plane stress, you get twinning. And I thought that was a beautiful um, micrograph. But um, back to the uh, concept of atomic, le re uh, atomic level resolution, which really wasn't accomplished until um, the early 90s with aberration corrected HRTEM. So a little bit of background, um, and this by no means represents uh, everything that led up to uh, MEMS, but I think these are salient uh, accomplishments or inventions and we have to start with, absolutely have to start with, the invention of the transistor at Bell Labs in 1947 by John Bardeen, Walter Batain, and well I'm not sure exactly how he got in there, but William Shockley did get in there as well. And uh, they, um, they did receive the Nobel Prize for that in 1956. So it really was these two guys, though, I, I submit, that, that really came up with this idea. Bertain built uh, the first single point transistor, and that's it right there. That's a photograph of it. Not sure how well you can see this, but this entire construction is about a half an inch high. So the first transistor was about that big. And that's uh, a piece of plastic that has been coated with a very thin um, gold foil. And it was um, Bardeen who told Retain, what you have to do is you have to have about a two thousandths of an inch gap between your conductors for this to work. So what they did was they just took a very, very sharp razor blade and slit, put a slit right in the tip uh, of the gold that's over this plastic um, triangle, and that's a piece of geranium, germanium underneath it. And uh, that started the whole thing, in my opinion, 1947, because the transistor opened up everything. And I, I submit that that is, in fact, the seminal invention of the 20th century and affects us even today. And you're going to do one on the uh, curly cues and the angles and uh, the, the wires? Yeah, all right, that's a spring, so they can get this um, apparatus to be close but not touching the geranium, geranium. and then that's um, the signal coming in. So first integrated circuit, Texas Instruments 1958, Jack Kilby. That was in uh, germanium as well. But then of course Fairchild later that year, uh, and I'm sure you all know who Robert Noyce is, came out with the first silicon IC. Sir? Um, where exactly on that photograph would the uh, inner base be collected? All right, well, you've got to, you've got to regard ger the germanium as the, the uh, base. And the emitter is one side and the collector is the other side of the gold foil. So there's a little slit, right? There's a little slit. Very, very, like a 2,000 slit in the gold. Um, so, so noise with the first silicon IC, and then we skip way forward. There was a lot of stuff that happened in between there, but in the early 60s, and I couldn't figure out exactly who it was that did this, so I just assumed that it was done simultaneously at, at different locations, but um, in the early 60s, 
the concept of isotropic etching of silicon was developed. I think that was at Bell Labs. Was it Bell? Some of those people from Bell then went to TI. Okay. Now that's important because um, isotropic etching and anisotropic etching of silicon actually are the basis for surface and bulk micromachining technology, which is the, the basis of MEMS. So the anisotropic etching in 67. Um, then I skip forward and, you know, one could debate this, right? But um, I, after doing some research, I, I came to the conclusion that the first um, real sort of MEMS-ish device, it wasn't called MEMS then, but the MEMS, first MEMS-ish device was a silicon pressure sensor and it was put out by National Semiconductor. The reason I say that, it was produced in volume and it was sold commercially. All right, so that's, that was sort of what I was using as my benchmark. The advent of micromachining was in the early uh, 1980s, again, at multiple uh, university research facilities. And then the term microelectromechanical systems was coined in 1987 as a result of a series of workshops, and it came out of these workshops. I'm not sure if there was actually an individual that was associated with that name. I didn't find that in my research. But if anybody comes up with that, I'd love to have that in my little bag uh, of tricks. But uh, that's when the first actual reference in the literature that I saw to micro-electromechanical systems. So, what are MEMS? Well, that's an acronym. Micro, because the structures are miniature and they're produced using microfabrication techniques. So that's where the micro comes from. Electro because they do involve electrical signals and the control thereof. Mechanical because there are mechanical elements and the, the operation is based on mechanics and, and uh, mechanical capability. And then systems because it's uh, integrated functionality and packaging. And some of the examples that I'll show a little bit later um, definitely bring that out. And I probably don't need to do this for this audience, but as a reminder of what we're talking about here, MEMS devices occur on the order of microns, okay? Maybe submicron to 100 microns, somewhere in that arena. And of course a micron is 10 to the minus 6 meters, and I'm dating myself because um, actually the term micron, I'm told, is now obsolete and especially my friends in the UK all tell me that I'm using the incorrect term, I should be saying micrometer, but I can't get rid of it. I still say micron. And um, uh, the human, the normal human hair, maybe not mine, but uh, normal human hair is about 80 microns in diameter. So that's what we're talking about in scale lengths for MEMS. These devices, the, the actual components of the devices, on the orders of tens of microns, so less than the diameter of a human hair. So we are talking very small. Now, before I go on, I did bring one, one prop today, one prop and one prop only. And the reason I brought this prop really doesn't have that much to do with this lecture. A little bit. It's for contrast, okay? It's for contrast. So on the one hand, I have MEMS devices and microelectronics um, semiconductor microelectronics capability that I wear on my um, belt, and I'm not cool, I'm kind of dated. This is an old Motorola Razor. You know, it does have 3G capability, but I'm not allowed to use it because it costs too much for the monthly fee. But Don has an iPhone. You still have your iPhone, I, I assume. Yep. Yes. And everybody I know has an iPhone. In fact, I was in a store the other day, and I was really impressed because I would never do this with my phone. Salesman is standing there telling me why I should have an iPhone. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I should have an iPhone. And he took the phone. This is in an AT&T store down by Costco. He takes the phone and he threw it. He literally threw it across the room. Then he picked it up, opened it up, and made a call. He said, what do you think? I went, wow, that's pretty impressive reliability. He threw the iPhone. Most things are built like tanks. This, I wouldn't drop it. I wouldn't give it the one one meter shock test. So why did I bring this? To show you the contrast. I gave a guest lecture last Tuesday at University of California Davis, freshman uh, review class in material science. 
There were about 40 kids in that class, and I showed a picture of uh, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard on one of the slides, and I said to them, do you notice what Dave has in his hand? And I point at it with the, the laser. I go, well, that's a slide roll. Nothing, right? I go, okay. How many of you have seen a slide roll before? Not one hand. Zero. And I went, oh my God, am I that old? This is my picket 1A. I'm very proud of it. I got it when I was in fifth grade. This is why I can't do the multiplication tables. I never learned to multiply because I learned how to use a slide rule. Why learn the multiplication tables if you can do way better with one of these things? This is where we came from, but look where we are now. All right, that was my only prop. I had to get it in there somehow. $50 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't use it too much. In, uh, now I have a, an HP 15C calculator. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty outdated, but I love that thing. Okay, so back to MEMS. MEMS materials. Well, this is not a comprehensive list again, but just to give you a taste, silicon and its derivative, derivative silicon oxide, polysilicon, um, silicon nitride. Uh, Galley arsenide had to put that in there. Uh, is used as a MEMS material. Specifically, Agilent is using gallium ar arsenide in MEMS, and I'll, I'll talk about um, one of our MEMS projects that we're working on a little later. Silicon germanium, glass, of course, various polymers. I used to stick my nose up at polymers when I was in school. I thought they were kind of low-class material. And then I got out of school, and guess what? Everything involved polymers. wish I would have paid attention to class. I had to go relearn all the stuff. And then, of course, various different metals, gold, nickel, titanium, tungsten, platinum, chromium. What's a polymer? Uh, uh, plastic. Fancy word for plastic. Yeah, I, uh, I was like, eh. What was that movie? Uh, good. Oh, jeez, I can't remember the name of the movie where, where the guy tells the young man in college, he goes, I have one word for you. Plastics. It's the future. The graduate. It's the future. Plastics. Now it's going, oh, no. <laughs> All right, so I love equations. This is the only equation I have in here. I had to work hard to get an equation in there, right? Men's fabrication equals m cubed. And m cubed is miniaturization, multiplicity, and microelectronics. Now, why did I put that up there? Well, because there are three m words that fit well with my equation. No, actually, that does represent something to me. MEMS you can think of as having three basic characteristics. One is miniaturization. Obviously these are very small, compact devices. Multiplicity comes from the fact that MEMS technology, as is microelectronics technology, is based on photolithography, and that means high volume and replication. So multiplicity. And then of course microelectronics, because MEMS, the whole technology, grew out of and is based on uh, IC fabrication. So IC fabrication is microfabrication and it is the basis for an enabling technology for MEMS development. Now there are a few differences but there are a few things that I'll show. Now, microfabrication means a clean room, which means you wear a bunny suit. Now, one of those guys is me, and one of them is it. Can you figure out which one of those two guys is me? Even my manager probably can't figure out which guy. <laughs> that's me right there with my thumb up. Right? And that's my buddy Mike. So Mike and Mike. And that is a wafer level body machine. This is in our class 1000 clean room um, in building one lower at Agilent Technologies in Santa Rosa. And that's one of the processes I'm responsible for, which is wafer-level bonding. So development of, of wafer-level bonding for our um, project, which I'll talk about a little later. But uh, my wife loves this picture. And she said, you know, that's really interesting. She said, I think I want to work in the clean room because I want to wear a bunny suit. And I said, why do you want to wear a bunny suit? She goes, it's the great equalizer. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, she said, nobody looks hot in a bunny suit. If I'm standing next to Sharon Stone in a bunny suit, it doesn't matter. They don't know who to look at. I said, okay. So, to um, get an appreciation of MEMS, um, 
uh, fabrication technology, we actually have to do a very quick overview of microfabrication, that is semiconductor processing that's used um, and has been used for um, uh, decades. And thus I submit that the salient features of microfabrication technology are thin film growth, doping, lithography, etching, dicing, and packaging. So, thin film growth from the standpoint of putting crystalline materials on crystalline materials. Crystalline thin films, either epitaxial, that is the um, lattice spacing of the thin film that you're putting on the substrate, very closely matches or, or is identical. Or heteroepitaxy, where there is a slight difference, um, not too much, but a slight difference in the uh, crystal structure such that um, you have some issues going on at the interface, such as lattice strain. Um, epitaxial is easy. When you're sputtering silicon on silicon, that's pretty easy. Uh, even silicon dioxide on silicon is easy. But it gets a little bit different when you start putting other things like silicon nitride on gallium arsenide. So now you've got a heteroepitaxial system. Doping, you can take such things as pure semiconductors and introduce impurities into them, either by thermal diffusion or ion implantation, and change the electronic properties of the materials. This is a wonderful concept. This is a tr tremendously wonderful concept that we can do this at an atomic level, change the fundamental properties, the electrical and other properties of materials by doping them with what would be construed as um, impurities. Lithography is the basis for all microfabrication technology. It's a pattern mask using photoresist, step and repeat. It allows us to have wafers with thousands to millions of devices on one wafer, depending on the size of your wafer, of course. Uh, at Agilent, we work in uh, three inch, uh, but six inch and eight inch is very common in the industry now, and they're even moving toward 12 inches. Uh, etching, selective removal of material uh, using either wet or dry techniques. Uh, wet techniques is chemical etching, dry techniques such as reactive ion etching, where um, you bombard uh, the material with a plasma. Again, you're, do, you're using pattern mass and a photoresist to define areas that um, don't get removed compared to areas where material is removed. So once you've got your wafer and you've got all your devices on it, then you dice up the wafer. It's either saw, it's, it's sawed into individuals. Uh, nowadays, we also use lasers. Sawing is usually um, the most common way. And then finally, you've got your device and you've got to do something with the individual die to protect them. Right, so you have this whole concept of packaging, sir. So what is the packaging temperature? What temperature do you use for the MIPS packaging? Is it 18 for uh, other stuff? The temperatures for for lithography or 18? Oh, um, well, um, probably the the highest temperature that anything um, sees is going to be in the in the packaging if you're doing a wafer level packaging process. Generally, those processes are up around 275 to 350. Uh, for MEMS, you can get away with that. Uh, you can get away with 350, but in semiconductor processing, many of the devices will not withstand temperatures over, say, 250, 275, so you have to be careful with that. But that would probably be the highest temperature that one sees. So, is that is there any possible that the metal will uh, vaporize or get some sort of bubble? Yeah, well, you know, when you're depositing things using um, plasma techniques, you actually are vaporizing the metals um, uh, in uh, de various different plasma deposition techniques. And yes, you can have problems with bubbles or uh, the adherence of metals. And again, that comes back to the heteroepitaxial nature of, of putting crystalline materials on top of crystalline materials. Some of these materials are amorphous, but most of the materials we're working with either in microfabrication or in MEMS technology are definitely crystalline materials. I mean, and that's sort of a basis for the whole technology. So now here's where microfabrication and MEMS fabrication deviate a little bit. MEMS does use all those things I talked about on the last slide. Um, but it has some other 
uh, techniques that are not necessarily solely used in MEMS, but fairly peculiar to MEMS and um, have been used to great advantage. So one of them is bulk micromachining. This, I submit, is a subtractive technique. Um, both wet and dry etching, again, we talked about chemical etchants to remove, or um, plasmas or, or reactive uh, ion etching. Um, we use etch masks and stops, right? So you put a mask on top, or you can have a layer that acts, a layer of material that acts as a stop. So maybe you're um, uh, chemically etching down through one material and it hits a material that the etch it won't etch and it, it stops once it hits it so it doesn't go any deeper. This is used to sculpt, if you will, 3D micromechanical elements. It's a relatively inexpensive technique and it's used for relatively simple structures. There are two basic uh, ideas there though. The isotropic etching, which I, I spoke about before, where the etching occurs pretty much the same in all directions. However, anisotropic etching depends on the crystal, crystallography of the material. So certain planes will etch faster than other planes, and you can get this type of behavior where you don't have undercuts, but you have very sharp sidewalls. The anisotropic etching actually turns out to be very important in the next technique, which is surface micromachining. Now, I'm calling this an additive technique, but that's not really true. The reason I'm using that is the term additive is because it's a repetitive layer by layer process. You put down uh, combinations of structural layers and sacrificial layers, again, always using the photoresist and the lithographic techniques, right? So that you can get this multiplicity that we talked about. Um, but here we're building up layers and removing layers uh, preferentially by selectively etching of a sacrificial material. This is a more expensive process. It's used for complex structures, but it is capable of producing some freestanding uh, mechanical elements like this one that you see, these gears that you see over here. This, this micrograph actually came from Sandia National Labs. Uh, Paul Bianco was very um, Curiously gave, gave me this uh, particular um, particular slide, and these are actually working gears. It's a, a very small micro machine, if you will. But this um, uh, cross-sectional view gives an idea of the sort of the idea of surface surface micro machine. What we have here is a silicon substrate. The green is a nitride, so that would be an etch stop. Uh, the light green is a sacrificial oxide and then the different colors of red and magenta and purple are polysilicon and we can then um, etch away the sacrificial oxide leaving freestanding um, elements and, and that's the basis for MEMS. Um, for rotary uh, systems like that one, what say the gear, what might be is there anything that would be considered like a bearing on the inside? That is one of the areas that, no, and that is one of the areas they're working on now. And actually, that's sort of a future. They, they don't really have of the equivalent of a bearing. Um, and the problem is that the reliability of these types of systems, because there are no bearings, the reliability is not that good. They will break down. However, I was amazed to hear um, uh, Bianco told me that they're capable of producing these micro machines with um, rotational speeds on the order of like 300,000 RPM. I mean, they're small, right? So, I mean, that's one advantage. But that is, I mean, it, it, it seems like it doesn't scale. It seems like, well, you, what would you have to do to do that in an automobile engine? 300,000 RPM. That's, that's amazing. Sir? How about the rotation in that? The yeah, you don't want you don't want to put contaminants in there, so we're not yeah. going to spray WD-40 in there. Actually, um, that's a good point, but they actually rely on the tribology of the materials themselves. So it turns out that silicon and germanium um, and some of the other materials that are used in MEMS have excellent tribological um, characteristics. So they're they're sort of Sort of, they're, first off, they're smooth, but they're sort of self-lubricating. 
to get a little bit of, of, of silicon dust in there, it actually acts as a lubricant. How would the negative degradation be? Sorry? How would the separating these two components by negative degradation? That can be done. And there are some um, system, MEM systems uh, built on magnetic or, or magnetic phenomena. Um, I'm actually not going to show any of them, but I've seen some of those devices. Now, there's one other fabrication technique I did want to talk about briefly, and that's LIGA. Now, don't get me on the, the acronym game here because that is a German term. Um, it actually, it, it, it's the German words for lithography, electroforming, and molding. So, I, I refer to it as micromolding, but truly, it's, it's LIGA. And uh, LIGA basically use molds to define your structural layer deposition. Okay, again, it's same sort of sequence as in microfabrication. You have a mask, you do lithography, you develop um, to, to remove, selectively remove material, but now it's different. You use electroforming, which is a, an electrolytic process, a, 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 if you will, electroplating process, right, to um, put material in. Now that's your structural layer, right? And then you etch release out the mat or the uh, mold, leaving just the structural material, in this case, a metal. These are really tiny, small gears. These, these gears are, um, and I don't have a, a micron bar, but they're probably on the order of about 100 microns across. And you can see these little tiny gear teeth. They're really small. Um, and this was done with Liga. So you produce a three-dimensional metal structure as your component, or you actually produce a mold insert that you can then use to inject such things as metals, polymers, glasses, or ceramics to make other kinds of components. It's really good for very high aspect ratio microstructures, and it's a relatively inexpensive process. So in addition to the microfabrication techniques, we have bulk micromachining, surface micromachining, and then this LIGA technique, all used to produce MEMS type devices. You have to always say something about packaging. I'm not going to get into detail. This is a whole lecture in and of itself. A couple examples. There's an SMT. Um, uh, I believe that is a pressure sensor. Uh, but basically what you're looking at is that um, it provides some functionality. Mechanical support, protection from the environment, and electric connect, re electrical connection to the system. Generally, we talk about either hermetic or quasi-hermetic. Um, and hermetic could be defined as less than 10 to the minus 8 standard cc's helium per second leak rate. Uh, quasi-hermetic would be uh, more along the lines of 10 to the minus 4. Pa the package type depends on the application. That's why it gets so complicated to talk about MEMS packaging. There are metal packages, ceramic packages, thin film, multi-layer packages, plastic packages, and then my favorite, wafer level packaging. And that's the only one I'm going to make a brief comment about. In the rest of the cases, you've got some small little either metal or ceramic package. In the case of metal packages, it's really easy to make them hermetic because you can put a metal lid on it and you can laser weld the lid on it. Um, plastic packages by nature are quasi-hermetic at best. Um, uh, thin film multi-layer packages are very inexpensive. They are quasi-hermetic at best. But the wafer level packaging, whether it's done by anodic bonding, uh, eutectic bonding, which is basically a soldering technique, or what we're doing in Agilent is gold-to-gold uh, -gold thermal compression bonding. In that case, you take your wafer with your devices on it. In our case, it's a MEM switch. And we have many of these switches on a 3-inch gallium arsenide wafer. We then have a cap wafer that has a bunch of little cavities that have been etched into it. We perfectly align, and I mean perfectly, within, you know, angstroms. Well, all right, maybe nanometers. Well, no, not really, probably microns. But, you know, I was just seeing if you were paying attention. Uh, you align them probably within about two to three microns rotationally, and uh, also in, in XY. And then you apply about one kilonewton of force at about 300 to 350 C, hold it for about four hours, and what you get is interdiffusion between the gold pads on both sides, and you get a metallurgical bond that is actually turns out to be hermetic. 
So this is now becoming probably one of the most widely used techniques. Why? Because now you've got your wafer, you dice it up, you've got your individual devices, and if you're clever like Agilent and have backside vias and patterned metal on the back, you can now take these devices, they're hermetic, you can then insert them either into other packaging or put them right into um, assemblies as they are. Um, so the wafer level packaging um, is now um, being regarded as not just for MEMS but is, is now being extended to um, standard semiconductor processing as well. I uh, wanted to say a little bit of something about MEMS integration. Uh, th what happens is because MEMS and ICs are fabricated using the same basic tools, it wasn't too big of a stretch to go from these little micro machines to micro machines with control circuitry. Um, so you're integrating micro machines and microelectronics into the same die, if you will, into the same chips. They have a complementary functionality, but there's a trade off. The trade off is that if you want to integrate microelectronics in your MEMS device, you have to do it very early on in the design cycle. That is expensive to do that. It takes development and process work. However, the trade off is at the end, if you've got something that works really well, you can make cash off of it. So there's a payoff in production, and you have to weigh those trade offs. The advantages of integration well, basically, they minimize a number of effects that are these sort of unknown variables, right? When you're putting a component into a system, if you've got to have control electronics that are separated, then you've got all kinds of things going on in the relationship between your microelectronics and your MEMS devices. Such things as mechanical or thermal stresses, electromagnetic interference, parasitic capacitance, electrical leakage. You can overcome many of these variables, if you will, by integrating the microelectronics and the MEMS into the same die. Disadvantages? Well, there's the development cost. The design complexity goes, it's not linear. It really is exponential. As you start doing more and more integration, it gets really difficult to design. So it's not just the design, but there's also the processing. And then, of course, the application itself may limit how much in integration that you can do. So now, in the last few minutes, I'm going to quickly go through um, a number of applications, um, just uh, sort of to pique your interest. So uh, pressure sensors were actually one of the first MEMS devices. That is an um, automobile engine intake uh, manifold control device made by Bosch for their engines. And it's, it's you know, that's about the size of the head of a pin right there. It plugs right in. Um, so it can monitor the air to fuel ratio going into um, uh, into the internal combustion engine and and make changes to that air to fuel ratio. Um, these pressure sensors are built on flexible diaphragms that deform in the presence of some pressure differential. Um, they're converted to an electrical signal at the output, and I won't get into it, but it. it it's based on a very interesting characteristic of germanium and uh, silicon. They are piezo-resistive materials. That is, if you apply a strain to them, some force uh, causes a strain, it actually changes the resistance of the material. And, and so that can be used um, to generate a signal. Um, and this little jewel here, if you're carrying a cell phone, and I'm betting every single person in this room, anybody not carrying a cell phone on them right now? Oh my gosh. <laughs> here, you want to borrow my uh, slide rule? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, well, if you've got a cell phone, then you've got one of these. A little cell phone microphone, and that is basically a pressure sensor. That's how it works. It's got a little flexible diaphragm in it. So, um, same technology is used in that little tiny chip. Accelerometers. They're all around us. Lots of them. This is probably the second most prolific application of MEMS after uh, pressure sensors is accelerometers. Basically, an inertial mass is suspended by springs. And I really mean springs. Um, Hey, we've got wireless networks around here, but we don't care about them, do we? 
stop my uh, my wire my Wi-Fi switch is acting up again. Yeah, you can switch off. I mean, there's a switch that you. To, uh, oh, I think I got it. Yeah. I didn't want to. I didn't want to get out of the, the program and turn it off. Um, there, there. The mass is then deflected from its original position by some change in inertia, and again converted to an electrical signal at the output. The the best example of this one is um, um, even in not so modern cars is the uh, uh, for automobile airbag deployment. These are the sensors. You can't read all this stuff. This is a good example of MEMS and microelectronics integration. So there's the actual sensor. There's the resistive element. There's a preamp over here. There's a self-test function, a reference function. What's that? Ah, the carrier generation. I can't read that. Oscillator. There's a buffer. Can't read that. Some other stuff over here. An output amp. So this airbag accelerometer, which is extremely small, um, has a lot of elements in it. Uh, this one here is an angular accelerometer that measures acceleration in Z, so any acceleration going into the unit this way. Uh, for the automatic uh, airbag accelerator, where are they exactly located in the, in the car? You know, I think they're actually um, usually in the in the steering column, but they can actually be almost anywhere. Yeah. Um, but I think they put them there to to make them as close as possible to the actual airbag, so that you don't have them. There would be multiplicity of them because it would not be only one. There would be maybe many. Right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think they're actually located very close to the actual airbag themselves. But that's a good question. I'm going to find that out. I just always assume that they were, you know like in the steering column somewhere. But yeah. I don't know that for yeah, that, a fact. For example, I mean, there are the airbags which can come that way from, from the side. Sure, the right, there's ones from the side now, right? Volvo's got that now. I think Mercedes has got it. In fact, pretty soon they'll all have it, I'm sure, because it yeah. seems like a great idea. Okay, I just added this slide about 10 minutes before I drove down here um, because I didn't have a micrograph, and then I found one. So I had to put this in here. So digital storage, right? Um, conventionally, in, in uh, my laptop, you know, I've got my hard drive is mag, you know, a magnetic recording head, right? You've got flash storage, which is based on a, a capacitance type. Well, IBM came out with this thing called the Millipede, and I think this is very, very cool. It is used as non-volatile computer memory. You can put one terabit of storage in a square inch, a terabit. That is incredible to me. What this thing does, it, it operates as, as an atomic force probe. So you can see this cantilever here, and there are tens of thousands of them. And they, they write little nanoscopic pits that are burned into a thermally sensitive polymer layer. Um, and I think this, they came out with this in 2007, and I don't think they have it quite perfected yet, but this to me looks, and these are truly MEMS devices that are pros, and I think this stuff is going to be... Talk, if we talk about, let's say, a bit of a sort of where, I mean, where would the, the, the bit is going to, I mean, basically a storage now? It's down here in this, this polymer layer, uh -huh. so that's the, the, if you will, that's the read-write head right here. It's, it's so that, that thing is somehow it's going to represent a one or a zero there? I mean, when you right. It, it burns a little pit. That's the bit, is, is the pit. Either the pit is there or the, the pit's not there. So that's the binary. So once you write on it, that's it? No, no. It, this, this polymer material, and I'm not sure what the polymer is because I think that's fairly proprietary, but you can, you can make the little pit and you can fill in the little I mean, it's sort of like you shape it. Yeah, you shape it, right? And then the P stands for what? The millipede? P is uh, the millipede. Uh, um, yeah, that, that is actually a, a millipede is an insect. It's an insect with many, many little legs. So that's, you know, that's where they got the name because it's got all these little devices are built into this thing. And it actually looks like that, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So micro engines is probably the most glamorous 
type of MEMS device, and these are the ones that you, you usually see pictures of, right? Um, the micro engines are very complex in their mechanical functionality. Essentially, they're small gears with very high rotational speed, and um, this guy here is an electrostatic micro motor that was developed by Richard Miller at UC Berkeley. I always have to throw that in there, the UC Berkeley stuff, you know. And uh, here's a uh, pop-up 3D micro mirror um, that uh, is at, that was I think originally developed at BSAC. So these mirrors pop up. Now this isn't the, the technology here that's DLP that Texas Instruments did. These actually pop all the way up out of the plane, whereas TIs just tilt slightly to, to reflect. Uh, these are used uh, mainly what, in laser things? Yeah, this is for laser applications, for rerouting lasers, for like inter, interfer, uh, interferometry and, and those types of applications. All right, so here's uh, a little bit on uh, MEMS. And then I only have one more slide. Um, this is uh, Agilent. I, I can now talk about this for um, about a year and a half. I wasn't allowed to say anything, but now it's it's out. Uh, in fact, DARPA knows about it, and they're jumping up and down. Um, Agilent is uh, developing an RF MEM switch. Our, our substrate is gallium arsenide. Everybody else, ooh, gallium arsenide. Yeah, they must be doing something really secret. I, no, the, the only reason we're using gallium arsenide is because that's what our semiconductor fab, that's the technology we're based on. There's no point in us introducing all the silicon processes when we already had gallium arsenide. So there's no big, you know, secret to why we're using gallium arsenide. It's not about speed or anything like that, like you use in the semiconductor, because it's a direct band gap semi. It doesn't matter. It's a structure material. We just use it because that's what our fab's based so on. So it's not because of its uh, small band gap? No. Really? No. Cause, cause now, later when we start integrating microelectronics with it, then it could come into play. But right now, it's only structural. In fact, most of this stuff, if you look, this is a side view. So there's the actual cantilever, there's the pull down electrode, and there's the contact electrode. So, um, you know, you pull the cantilever down electrostatically, so the switch is either open or it's closed. And our very first switch is uh, SPDT, single pull, double throw. Um, but you've got to get your signal out of there, right? In and out. And we do that through vias, through this, this uh, MEMS chip, uh, with some backside metallization. And then here's the gold pad on the MEMS chip. And then here's the cap wafer, which is also gallium arsenide. Uh, for no other reason than that's what we have there. And there's gold. And so you can see this construction then. So my little piece of this is the contact metallurgy, which turns out to be a big, big deal for reliability, and um, the wafer level bond. Yeah. A couple of questions. First of all, how, how, how fast can this uh, uh, switch uh, basically go on and off if you want it to operate? Um, uh, microseconds. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you exactly how how fast I can't, yeah. but um, let's say the the speed of the switch is not really that critical because the application for this switch is to go against um, uh, uh, diode based switches or um, mechanical switches, and in that arena you're not you're not really talking about fast because it, you open and close and then something happens for a while and then you open yeah. and it's not it doesn't have to open and close really rapidly. We care about it being able to open and close rapidly because we want to test the reliability and we don't want to sit there for three months while it open and closes a hundred billion times. Right? I want it to open and close a hundred billion times in a couple of days, not a couple of weeks. Yeah. And then the rating, the current and voltage rating on this, you are talking about like how many, how many uh, uh, microampere or how ampere and then voltage. Uh, voltage I can talk about. Um, the uh, it operates at, at 80 volts for for pull down, right? So one of the issues is getting it from, um, you know, in most systems you're talking three or four volts, right? Yeah. Not 80, right? So you have to have um, uh, something that goes steps down and or steps up for this device. Yeah. Uh, your other question? And the other, yeah, the, and the ampere, ampere. How, how that I can't talk about. You cannot talk. About. And then uh, finally, uh, would sparking, uh, because you are talking about, let's see, in fact, the high voltage you are talking about, more than three volts, okay, 
and then uh, such a small gap, would there be any uh, uh, chances of uh, sparks? Um, no, you know, we're not, I mean, this is such a small device, right? That 80 volts um, for the pull-down electrode um, is contained within the device itself. So outside of the device, we don't see that. Um, so I've never, you know, I mean, I can't look inside this thing. I can't tell you that it doesn't arc. I've never, I've never. The, the other question that you asked is relative to that, right? Because there's, there's voltage and then there's current, right? So, but I'm not talking about the current. Um, but let's put it this way. This is not a high power switch, okay? It, it's a very low power switch. And then there would not be any chances of... Uh, uh, shall we say uh, oxidization or whatever? I mean, after some time, uh, because of that us. there that is a possibility, right? That's why we seal it hermetically. That's why it has to be extremely clean, no moisture, and specifically no organic contamination inside this thing when we seal it, mm -hmm. because that will affect the reliability. When you're looking for a switch that goes a hundred billion cycles over its lifetime, you don't want. Um, such things as um, poly uh, polymerization occurring inside because you left some some um, organic contaminants and you start your, your beating on it, right? But again, these aren't like classical uh, mechanical switches where there's a lot of force. You know, we're talking millinewtons here, not you know tens of newtons. So it's a SPDT ohmic switch. It uh, uses gold for the cantilever and gold alloy contacts, and I won't talk about the specific alloys. It's wafer level package. It's pretty fast, fast enough. It's hermetic, and it's very reliable, and that's the key. And that's the backside of you see the backside metalization with the I/O there. Can you please tell me why you are using selecting this gold metal most of the time? Why we're using gold? Yeah. Why well, there's a couple reasons that we're using gold. One of them is it's got excellent um, electrical conductivity, but it's also something that we can electroplate. We actually electroplate that. It's not sputter because that's pretty. The cantilever is pretty thick, so we don't sputter that. We electroplate it, and um, you can get gold. You can electroplate gold fairly thick, you know, 35, 40 microns, without inducing a tremendous amount of stress. So you don't want stress in your cantilever because then your cantilever deflects. How big is the cantilever, by the way? I mean, you are talking about 40 micron now. The leg. The the cantilever is is about. Uh, 35 microns. That's that's pretty hunker for a MEMS device. But yeah, it's about 35 microns long. How about the, 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 the stabilizing the switch itself? I mean, when you let's say switch it on, is there a delay for it to stabilize the connection? No. Um, one of the problems with these types of cantilevers is that you sometimes get resonance, so they bounce. Right? So that's why the high voltage. When we snap this thing shut, we don't want it to bounce. And that's where you run into problems. And that's why uh, most of these ohmic switches use these high voltages because you want them to snap shut and stay. You don't want them to go did -did 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 -did, right? and stabilize. That is a pro resonance is a problem. Not for us, of course. We've solved that problem. But, but that, is, that is an issue with these types of MEM switches. And then there are a slew rate for the electricity for the off to on, yes. that, that mm -hmm. doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really affect, for, it's not really critical for the, for the application that you're using. No. Mm -hmm. No. It's, it, that slew rate that you're talking about is not the gating factor. Uh, where do you use this, by the way? I'm sorry? Where do you use this thing? This These switches, um, the very first application is to replace an accessory that Agilent makes that's based on a solid state switch. Yeah. And um, the form function is going to be the same. So so um, many customers don't want the mechanical switches because they're big and bulky. So we have a solid state switch device. It's, a, it's sold as an accessory with our instrumentation. First application is to replace that. But um, we're hoping that someday these things are all over the place, you know, and... Uh, would a switch like this, because uh, you know how you do mechanical switches and then you have a, like a long time called surge and after a while things start to break because of uh, all these electrical Um, yes, because you're talking about um, very um, low currents 
and very small dimensions. Is this like so, a stepper switch that goes to the next level switch or something? Uh, no, not really. I mean, this truly is a, a standalone switch. Uh -huh. um, so it's just really small. Um, that's, is that a dime? Yeah. So uh, who's on a dime? I never remember this. FDR. Truman? No. FDR? FDR? FDR's on a yeah. dime? Well, that's FDR's nose, and there's the switch. So it's about 1.2 millimeter by 1.8 millimeter. So that's a pretty small switch for a uh, SPDT. Um, you know, if we get high, we probably will have to make the form factor a little bit bigger. That's the first one. So this is my last slide. We've actually gone over. Uh, I'm glad there were so many questions because that means you're interested in it. Because um, it's pretty interesting to me. I first got involved in men's around 1989 when I was at Cal, and uh, uh, that really caught my attention. I, did, I actually didn't work directly in MEMS. I was, I was working in high TC superconductors, but um, I was around the MEMS stuff, and I really liked it. So for the future, micro-electro-mechanical systems, why stop there? We'll go to nano-electro-mechanical systems. Is that, you know, like, like if, if Feynman was here, what would he say? Oh, sure, you can do that someday. Well, we, we've already done it. How Berkeley, unpublished, there it is. One gigahertz NEMS resonator. Those times there are about 35 nanometers wide. So this is essentially the world's smallest tuning fork, really. Um, so we're already there. Look at, look at the, the bar there, 200 nanometers. 200 nanometers. We're, we're now operating near atomic level with devices, functional devices. And the other one I'm showing here is Yang uh, in the, the chemistry department at UC Berkeley. These are silicon carbide nanowires on the order of 30 to 40 nanometers in diameter. So it's a whole forest of silicon carbide wires. And the reason I put that on there is because for future work, Higher functionality through process development. So we, we need to develop more processes so that we can include more functionality. And improve processes we have and develop processes that we don't have yet. We want smaller size with higher level of levels of integration. And this is going to require the development of new material systems and ways to use these materials, like these little nanowires, if you will. And that then concludes the presentation. I apologize for going over a little bit, but it um, seems like it was uh, uh, of interest. So thank you very much.